This is the first of three videos that I'm recording in 2022, which is several years after the other videos that are recorded in this class. I've been doing some research in the last few years about the general question of how economists assign, study the way that people assign value to commodities, and have come to the conclusion that the standard way of introducing the standard way of thinking about these problems, which includes social surplus in the standard textbook way that I've presented in, in this module, is not correct. And so I'm going to, this is the first of three videos in which I'm going to explain a more modern approach to valuation. In this video, I want to clarify the connection or lack of connection between consumer surplus and fairness. Suppose that society is trying to decide between two routes to build a new highway. Let's say that, uh, that one of the routes looks like this on a map, and the other route looks like this on a map. So that's route A, possible route A, and possible route B. So they have the same construction costs. Let's assume maybe there's some sort of obstacle here that the uh, highway can't pass through. And society is trying to decide whether to adopt Route A or Route B. Both of these routes, let's say, are going to destroy a residential subdivision. And the residential subdivision for Route A, let's say, is located in this area. The residential subdivision for Route B is located in this area. So one of these two residential subdivisions is going to be destroyed. The residential subdivision that Route A would destroy contains the homes of rich people. The subdivision that Route B would destroy contains the homes of poor people. The way that economists would decide using consumer surplus which route to recommend to the government would be to use consumer surplus to see which one of these neighborhoods was more valuable, the neighborhood that the rich people live in or the neighborhood that the poor people live in. Now, housing is a normal good, so when your income goes up, you demand more of it. So if you draw the demand curves, so demand for housing, price and quantity. We have the rich people, their demand for the kind of houses that rich people live in, and the poor people, and their demand for the kind of houses that poor people live in. And what we expect to see is that the demand curve that poor people have is maybe something like this. And the demand curve that rich people have is perhaps something like this. In other words, rich people have a larger demand than poor people. Because, of course, in an economics class, demand means effective demand. That means it's influenced by your income. Now, to be sure, on the left, what I'm talking about, well, on both of these, actually, I want to talk about is aggregate demand. So it's not merely that when you compare one rich person to one poor person, the rich person has a higher demand. Uh, it ha you, you have to aggregate up all the rich people for the demand curve on the left and all the poor people for the demand curve on the right. So if there are very few rich people and a lot of poor people, it could be the case that the demand curve for poor people uh, is a lot higher than what this looks like. But let's just take this as an example, because clearly this is just supposed to be meant as an example. Suppose that the number of structures that are going to be destroyed in either case is going to be 40. So the economist wants to know what's the economic cost of destroying these 40 houses. And if you use consumer surplus, then the consumer surplus of the poor people's 40 houses is the area under their demand curve. And the consumer surplus for the rich people's 40 houses is the area under their demand curve, which that might, might go up, you know, really high. 
so the yellow lines represent the yellow areas here represent consumer surplus and it's clear that the consumer surplus for the housing of rich people is much larger than the consumer surplus for the housing of poor people. So an economist using consumer surplus would say that the value of the poor people's home is le homes are, is, is, le is less than the value of the rich people's homes. And therefore, if you're trying to minimize the cost of society of building this highway, what you would decide to do is choose route B you'd want to demolish the homes of the poor people because you value those homes according to consumer surplus and according to consumer surplus value destroying the poor people's homes is not as big of a deal as destroying the rich people's homes would be therefore it's clear that consumer surplus just like everything else in in standard neoclassical economics is a function of the income distribution if you have an unfair if you, if you have an income distribution which you think is unfair, then the social decisions going to be made using consumer surplus are going to be unfair social decisions. This is not a particularly controversial statement, I think. It's, it, it just follows from where demand curves come from, that demand curves come from income. However, consumer surplus has been used in the field of law and economics, and in... In, in law and economics, it strikes me as being a rather odd fit. The law, at least in the United States, is supposed to be concerned with justice, equity, fairness. In principle, the law is not supposed to give rich people an advantage over poor people. Everyone is supposed to be equal in front of the law. But in economics and in consumer surplus, people are definitely not equal. Everybody's weighted by their income. That's where demand curves come from. So it's an odd fit to bring into a study of the law, which is supposed to be about fairness and justice, a concept like consumer surplus that has nothing to do with, with justice and fairness. Okay, so that's the first problem with consumer surplus. We'll discuss the second one in the next video.